Roman fleet was quite the underdog when it joined the naval battlefield. In order to stand a chance at survival, it had to quickly catch up to its more advanced rivals. Characteristically though, the Romans were not simply satisfied with mere survival. Instead, they sought domination and developed new weapons and tactics to become masters of the sea. Let us begin by analyzing what the Romans could bring to bear when it was time for battle. The main offensive weapon of a warship would be its ram, or rostrum, which could be used to sink or immobilize an enemy vessel. The rostrum was generally a cast bronze covering mounted to the front of a ship either at or below the waterline. Early designs were pointed. More often than not, however, attackers ended up impaling themselves onto their targets and being unable to disengage. Later designs avoided this issue by being blunt, so as to punch holes rather than pierce them. Impacts were understandably violent, and thus the four of ships would be reinforced to withstand contact and divert the shock of ramming back along the hull. However, ramming required skill. During the First Punic War, this was something the Romans lacked, and they were therefore desperate to find some way to even the odds. Ultimately, their answer was to transform naval warfare into a land battle by developing the Corvus. This was a tall boarding bridge roughly 36 feet long and 4 feet wide with a guard rail and a spike at the end. It was mounted on a pole to the front of a ship and could swivel from side to side. A system of pulleys allowed a crew to raise the bridge into an upright position and, when the time was right, drop the top heavy corvus onto the deck of an enemy ship. The spike would be driven deep into the wood decking, firmly holding the target in place and keeping it from retreating. At this point, the Roman marines would swarm aboard and quickly overpower the opposing crew. The corvus proved incredibly effective and the Carthaginians never truly found a countermeasure. It did, however, make ships unstable and may have been to blame for many of Rome's terrible losses in storms at sea. By the end of the First Punic War, the Republican Navy was much more experienced and seems to have discarded the Corvus, returning instead to ramming. The idea of a boarding tool, however, would later be resurrected during the Civil Wars. Apparently Octavian's right-hand man, Agrippa, invented an artillery-launched grappling hook called the Harpax. This was an iron claw attached to an 8 foot long plank bound in iron. Rings at the end connected it to ropes which ran back to a winch aboard the attacking ship. The harpax could be launched at great distance and apparently the length of iron grapple prevented it from being cut as a ship was slowly reeled in. The weapon was first used at the Battle of Noalakis in 36 BC and contributed to the lopsided victory over Sextus Pompey. It seems the harpax was soon countered by long scythes which could cut the ropes and was eventually abandoned. As ships became increasingly larger, they proved both less effective at ramming and more resistant to it. This led to a shift away from ramming and towards warships serving as mobile missile platforms which softened up the enemy before boarding action. Firing from an elevated position was just as useful at sea as it was on land, and therefore towers were often installed on ships to provide a fortified firing position along the bow and stern. Just like the Corvus, however, they could make ships unwieldy. Later commanders therefore developed and used collapsible towers which could be deployed just before a battle. During the civil wars, these would often be painted with a specific scheme according to the fleet they belonged to. Catapults, ballista, and scorpions also ended up being mounted on towers and the main deck. Triremes would have been the smallest ships to carry a single artillery piece, while conquerums could carry up to ten. The larger polyremes could obviously be able to carry even larger and more numerous weapons. Arrow throwers acted as ideal anti-personnel weapons. Apparently, these could reach targets 400 meters away, picking off marines on deck and rowers below them. Stone throwers were also used, although their greater size and higher firing arc made them harder to use. Nonetheless, onagers with experienced gunners could score hits on enemy vessels. However, these were not ship destroyers. Instead, direct hits were meant to damage tightly packed deck crew and cause mayhem on board. Larger artillery pieces were mounted on ships, but these were more often than not stone throwers meant for sieges or assault operations. The very biggest were capable of launching 260 pound rocks to take out fixed positions. Naval tactics employed by individual ships, squadrons, and fleets 
depended on the primary weapon system being used. We will first begin with the tactics where the primary weapon was the ram. In this scenario, warships were treated roughly like human guided torpedoes. One might therefore be tempted to imagine ships charging straight at each other in the equivalent of a naval jousting tournament. This however is incorrect, it would be devastating to both sides if it were true. In reality, warfare at sea involved a great deal of maneuvering. The front of a ship was its strongest point, while the sides were its weakest. It was therefore imperative to present the bow of one ship in defense while using speed and maneuverability to strike at the flank. Picking an attack angle was critical. Basic physics tells us that a perpendicular strike could deal tremendous damage at low speed, while ramming at an angle would require more speed to deliver a similar blow. However, a perpendicular attack was more likely to result in impalement, which would take both ships out of commission. Instead, the ideal tactic would be to attack from a stern at a narrow angle. This would rupture a wide section of the enemy hull whilst minimizing the risk of the ram breaking or becoming embedded. A highly skilled captain and his crew might even aim to strike a glancing blow that would shear off an enemy's oars. This would leave the enemy vessel dead in the water, allowing for a deadlier follow-up strike, or better yet, the capture of a ship with minimal damage. During these operations, it might be the case that a charging warship would retract its oars prior to impact to avoid crippling itself. Replacement oars would also have been present on board. Ship level tactics were therefore a dance in which opponents might circle one another seeking a decisive ramming opportunity. The presence of multiple ships, however, would make this much harder. As a result, the dance was simply expanded in scale as entire fleets sought to get at each other's flanks. A popular Greek tactic known as the Periplaus involved fixing the enemy's front line while sending fast ships around the flank to hit them from the exposed rear. Countering this tactic could be achieved by deploying in a defensive position as the Greeks did when outnumbered by the Persians at Salamis. It was also known that some ships might even form up in a complete circle to fend off attackers, and then, at some predetermined side, charge out in all directions and see the enemy off. Another Greek tactic which the Romans were surely aware of was the Diekplaus. This maneuver was geared towards piercing a battle line rather than attempting to flank it. The tactic was executed by sending a single ship into the gap between enemy warships. At the last moment, the captain would veer to the side and shear off oars of one of the opponent's ships, incapacitating it. A second warship would follow close behind and deliver a full speed ram to the crippled boat. At this point, a tear would form through which the rest of the attacking fleet would pour in and rip the opposition to pieces. Counter tactics to this maneuver involved holding back a reserve force to plug any gaps that might develop. The Carthaginians showed that novel tactics were also possible. At the Battle of Ignomus, for instance, they attempted an envelopment of the Roman fleet by giving way in the center and forcing their way around the sides. This tactic occurred 40 years before the Battle of Cannae and may have even inspired Hannibal's battle plans. During the First Punic War, the Romans were nowhere near competent enough to win a high skill ramming competition. As a result, they employed the Corvus and focused on boarding action. Tactics here were much, much easier. The basic idea was to always turn to face an opponent and simply drop the boarding bridge on them when they came within range. The Corvus could be swiveled around and had a rather long reach, which meant that even if an enemy ship was able to ram from the sides, it might get caught and boarded anyways. On a fleet level, Roman ships equipped with the Corvus typically used compact defensive tactics. This would allow each ship to cover the vessel next to it and present a nearly impenetrable front. During the Battle of Ignomus, the Roman fleet adopted a triangular formation so as to protect its warships and transports from attacks coming from multiple angles. In this battle, the Roman ships were also seen forming up shoulder to shoulder along the coast while the shoreline protected their rear. Such a position proved to be virtually unassailable. The Carthaginians were at a loss as to how to counter this tactic and suffered crushing defeats as a result. Eventually though, they did develop some form of counter tactic. This involved charging the Roman ships but halting, just short of impact with the hope that the Corvus would be dropped prematurely. At this point, 
there would be a brief window to strike before the Corvus could be reset. However, this maneuver required skill and luck, which, in the chaos of battle, could not always be relied upon. Due to this dynamic, naval tactics relied increasingly on simpler boarding operations. The goal became to overpower the enemy crew in close quarters. Generally, this was achieved by building bigger ships, which could hold more marines, archers, and artillery. Large ships were at an advantage in terms of manpower, but were lacking in the speed department. Their tactics would therefore rely on forcing some sort of engagement. This could be achieved by pulling their prey into combat with grappling hooks, such as the projectile fired hardbacks. Alternatively, artillery mounted on larger boats might allow them to batter enemy ships into submission. Small ships, on the other hand, relied on their speed. Their tactics would involve running rings around bigger ships while firing projectiles to even the odds. Incendiaries might be used to set fire to opposing warships. While these were unlikely to actually cause severe damage, they would distract the crew and draw manpower away from participating in battle. These tactics were used at Actium by Octavian's smaller ships, which fought Antony's colossal eastern vessels. When evenly sized ships faced off, tactics most likely revolved around using archers and artillery to thin enemy ranks in an initial skirmishing phase. However, to quote Adrian Goldsworthy, the amount of missile fire which could be delivered by a ship's marines and the artillery mounted on the larger ships was insufficient to inflict serious or incapacitating damage on an enemy vessel. At best, such fire could suppress the enemy prior to boarding. Shooting remained an adjunct to the main methods of attack and for this reason the wind was too uncertain a means of propulsion to be relied upon during battle. Therefore, all decisive combats necessitated physical contact between opposing ships. End quote. These types of engagements were more common during the Roman Civil War and appropriately describe the battles fought between evenly matched Hellenistic fleets. As is always the case, competition breeds innovation. The Romans and their martial culture proved insatiably competitive and thrived off adversity. Late to the naval game, they were forced to develop innovative weapons and tactics in their colossal struggle to conquer the Mediterranean world. As a result, the Republican fleet saw an explosive level of development. In fact, this period in time would represent a high point in galley warfare that would not be matched for years to come as the rate of Roman expansion leveled off and eventually reversed. Thank you for watching this series. I hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned for more.